I like to ask someone else to open with prayer when we start these. So it's a, like a devotional sort of thing. Would you be okay with that? Sure. Praying for us. Okay, sure. please do. Lord, we all need your help. We your grace to get through each day, and we ask you, Lord, to be with us and bless us time in your word, Lord, and help us to keep growing closer to you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'm going to just continue this one, I believe, perhaps more if we have time. 1888 Sermons by Ellen White. Can, it's kind of a keeping with the theme of righteousness by faith. So, Ron, I didn't get a chance to send it to you, but if you do, when you do get a chance, it is Councils to Ministers, October 21, 1888, Manuscript 8A, 1888. And it would be, there is a compilation online of the 1888 sermons. Don't have my, and please, uh, please do feel free to comment or ask a question or whatever good for discussion counsels to ministers I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, <clears throat> and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Brethren, I want to ask you a question. How can we come to God with full assurance of faith, if we bear no fruit that testifies to a change wrought in us by, gra by the grace of God, no fruit that shows that we are in fellowship with Christ, how can we approach God in faith and be abiding in Christ as, and he in us when our works show that we are not bearing fruit? What is the fruit that we should bear? The fruit of kindly words and deeds. In God's word we are told, what are the works of the flesh, and what are the fruits of the Spirit? Works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, adultery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Is not, this a, is not this sufficiently plain? None of us need walk in uncertainty. And they are they, they that are Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking or encouraging one another, or, sorry, provoking one another, one another, envying one another. In order to have true spiritual discernment, in order to be conscious of our own weakness and deficiency and our own unlikeness to Christ, we need a close connection with God. Then we shall have a humble opinion of ourselves. 
we shall be meek and lowly in heart, walking prayerfully and carefully before God. We shall not boast ourselves beyond measure. In every age, the gospel of ministry has tended to the same end, but every minute specification is not revealed in the word of God. He desires us to use our reason and experience by their help, adopting methods and plans which under the existing circumstances are for the benefit of the church and the schools and other institutions which have been established. By their fruits ye shall know them. If erroneous opinions are entertained, search the scriptures with hearts which are humble before God. Pray to the Lord, believing that he hears and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If we only believe, we shall receive the help we need. The message, go forward, is still to be heard and respected. The varying circumstances taking place in, the, in our world call for labor, which will meet these peculiar developments. The Lord has need of men who are spiritually sharp and clear-sighted, men worked by the Holy Spirit, who are certainly receiving manna fresh from heaven. Upon the minds of such, God's word flushes light, revealing to them more than ever before the safe path. The Holy Spirit works upon mind and heart, the time has come when, through God's messengers, the scroll is being unrolled to the world. Instructors in our schools should never be bound about by being told what they are to teach, only what has been taught hitherto. Away with these restrictions. There is a God to give the message his people shall speak. Let not any minister feel under bonds or be gauged by men's measurement. The gospel must be fulfilled in accordance with the messages God sends. That which God gives his servants to speak today would not perhaps have been present truth 20 years ago, but it is God's message for this time. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool in his own estimation, that he may be wise. An experience of this kind is needed here, right with the men who have been forward in, to speak in this meeting. A little background, most of you, I'm sure, or all of you are aware of the background of 1888, and, and uh, it was a difficult time in the church, actually, especially for Ellen White. And the men here that she's addressing have been mocking the message, mocking the messengers and the message that in she has a, a vision of them being in their room and mocking and telling them that God sees this. And uh, that's a little bit of background. And there are personalities involved, which names you will recognize. I'm not sure if she brings them up later, but so that's a little background of that, these, this sermon. An experience of this kind is needed here, right with the men who have been forward to speak in this meeting. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let man, no man glory in men. Do consider this, I beseech you. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Let men and women who are truly converted offer themselves in all humility to the service of the Lord, for verily he has need of them. First, they must be emptied of all selfishness. They must be cleansed vessels unto honor. They will reflect 
the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness to all with whom they come in contact. Partners of the divine nature, they will be partakers of the divine nature. They will be savers of life unto life. They will not talk of the faults of others, but will repeat the words of divine wisdom, which have penetrated and illuminated their hearts. They will be men who fear to talk and make sport of God's messengers, but men who pray much. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, behold him as in a glass of gl the glory of the Lord, a mirror, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord, John declares. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. As John studied the life of Christ in the Word, he beheld as in a glass the glory of the Lord, and he became changed into the, into the same image, from glory to glory, from character to character, till he was like that which he adored. He imitated the life in which he was delighted. He knew the Savior by an experimental knowledge. His master's lessons were engraved on his soul when he testified of the Savior's grace. The simplicity of his language was eloquent with the love that pervaded his whole being. He had not a doubt nor a suspicion. He entered into no controversy, no wearisome contention. In witnessing for Christ, he declared what he knew, what he had seen and heard. There was no supposition no guesswork about what he said. And when insult was put upon Christ, when he was slighted, John felt the slight to the very depths of his being and broke forth into indignation, which was a manifestation of his love for Jesus. Christ had humbled himself. He had taken man's nature, and few could see him as John saw him. But John had it an advanced experience. The darkness had passed away. On him the true light was shining, and in his epistles he breaks forth against sin, presenting Christ as the one who could cleanse from all iniquity. It was John's deep love for Christ that led him to desire always to be close by his side, and this position was awarded him. Jesus loves those who represent the Father, and John could talk of this love as no other disciples could. He reveals to his fellow men that which he knows by living experience it is his duty to reveal, representing in his character the character of Christ. The glory of the Lord was expressed in his face. The beauty of holiness which had transformed him shone with a Christ-like radiance from his countenance. Those who truly love God must manifest loving kindness of heart, judgment, and righteousness to all with whom they come in contact, for these are the works of God. There is nothing Christ needs so much as agents who feel the necessity of re representing him. Evil speaking and evil thinking are ruinous to the soul. This has been the current in this conference. There is nothing the church lacks so much as the manifestation of Christ-like love. As the members of the church unite together in sanctified association, cooperating with Christ, he lives and works in them. Our eyes need the anointing with the heavenly eyesight, that we may see what we are and what we ought to be, and that power is provided in Christ sufficient to enable us to reach the high standard of Christian perfection. We must keep Jesus, our pattern, ever before us. This is and ever will be present truth. It is by beholding Jesus and appreciating the virtues of his character 
that John became one with his master in spirit. With the spiritual vision, he saw Christ's glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And he was changed from glory to glory into his likeness, from character to character into his likeness. And to him was committed the work of telling of the Savior's love and the love of his children should manifest for one another. This is the message that we heard from the beginning, he writes, that we should love one another. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby we, hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed, and in truth. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. But, although John dwells so particularly on love, he does not clasp hands with sin. Hear his words regarding the apostate from the faith. He who has had a knowledge of the truth, but has departed from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Whosoever transgress, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed, is partaker of his evil deeds. Let us all consider this. The doctrine of Christ seems pretty significant. He dwells so particularly on love, the Apostle John, but he does not clasp hands with sin. So he doesn't excuse sin. Love does not excuse sin. And <clears throat> there's a something in the great controversy it's a quote on love and how talking about love 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 but there's no obedience i can't remember the quote and i wish i had it but john doesn't excuse sin because of love the lord has plain words for those who like the pharisees make great boast of their piety but whose hearts are destitute of the love of god the Pharisees refused to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he had sent. Are we in danger of doing the same thing as did the Pharisees and the scribes? Remember that she's addressing these men that are rejecting the message that could have brought about the coming of Christ. But while reproof is given, it must be given in accordance with Christ's direction. The Apostle Paul writes, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And what does that mean to restore someone that's uh, fallen, but to do it in the spirit of meekness, considering ourself? Any thoughts on that? Because it's kind of important, I think. It speaks for itself, really, doesn't it? It's hard to add to the spirit of prophecy or the word of God. 
but if we can relate it to our own experience as well and feel free to share something when it strikes you. We see individuals committing errors and we are pained because their lives are not in accordance with the Bible standard of righteousness. But we are not to become impatient. If we have the mind of Christ, we shall feel a burden for the welfare of him who has forgotten to be a doer of the word. Do not speak of his errors to others. Follow the rule Jesus has given. Go to the wrongdoer alone and see if by words of wisdom you cannot save him. The Apostle James, inspired by Jesus Christ, lays down our duty in clear lines. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. We are Christ's witnesses, Christ's representatives. In his epistle to Titus, Paul charges him to set in order things that are wanting in the church. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, he says. The teacher of truth is to educate all, both old and young. He is to exhort aged men to be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. When those who profess to be servants of Christ do not walk circumspectly, God is dishonored and the truth is reproached. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. I have been pained to hear so much jesting and joking among old and young as they are seated at the dining table. And again, they were jesting and joking about the conference uh, the young messengers, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, were young men. And they were speaking to the general conference, you could say. Men had been in the work their whole life. So they they weren't able to receive a message from someone smaller or lesser than them. Are these men aware that there is by their side a watcher who is disgusted with their spirit and the influence which they exert and is making a record of their words and actions? Will our ministers, young and old, countenance these things? Shall not we who name the name of Christ take heed to the words in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, if the truth, as it is in Jesus, abides in our hearts, it will sanctify our lives. Our speech will not be evil. Obeying the truth, we shall work the works of righteousness. By our words and deeds, we may reveal the power of the truth to transform the character. By our words and deeds, we may reveal the power of truth to transform the character. We may each reveal that we depend on Christ's righteousness, not upon our own manufactured righteousness. We may abide in Christ as the branch abides in the vine, having such a living connection with him that it is a pleasure to work as he worked, to be a help and a blessing to our brethren. We can work the works of Christ doing these things that are pleasing in his sight. In all you do, make Christ the center of attraction, constantly looking to him who is, our, who is your pattern, the author and finisher of your faith. Cultivate constant, fervent gratitude to God for the gift of his beloved Son. Represent Christ 
Squander not your moral forces upon trifles, but earnestly improve the opportunities given you to reflect the light of the Son of Righteousness. Seek to glorify, cease to glorify man, glorify glory in Christ and the truth. You may crown Jesus with honor, for though so meek and lowly, he was a daily conqueror over temptation. Every soul who is a partaker of the divine nature is an overcomer in his own behalf and is victorious, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through the lust. We are laborers together with God, and not only are we to have respect unto the recompense of reward, salvation, but we are to labor zealously for the Redeemer's glory by bringing sheaves to the Master. Every soul saved will swell the triumphant anthems of praise, which the redeemed will sing. In every fellow being, we are to see the purchase of the blood of Christ. The Savior's interest is identified with the interest of the souls he has ransomed by an infinite sacrifice. I'm just going to read that second last sentence again. In every fellow being, we are to see the purchase of the blood of Christ. Uh, that makes like it in my experience day to day whether it's like whoever I meet the most important thing to me uh, is to share God with them somehow you know in a way to think of a way that will be you know, wise as serpents and harmless as doves I took over a business in 2017, bought a business, and the previous owner was a former pastor, but he was so financially dependent upon making the company work that he was uh, afraid to mix God and his business. And when I took it over, I, I was sharing like a box of a hundred steps to Christ every month. I gave it to anybody and every customer. Uh, there was no hesitation whether they were a really big customer or just the one-time customer. And the people I was serving in Calgary, they were the 1%. They really were. A, it was a well-paying, good company. 35 years established. I only had it for about three, four years. I remember one, one of my clients, one of my clients, an artist, his paintings took about a year to make and he sold them for thirty, forty thousand dollars and going to a home to deliver a couple of paintings with him to a customer. And Edward Edward knew me and he was okay with me sharing literature with the customers. Sorta. Because he would say, Yeah, we want to tell people about Christ and about God. So that's okay. But this one customer, he met me at the door as I went out to the truck, coming back in to tie things up. And and he met me at the door with these wide eyes. He knew I was coming in with some literature and steps to Christ or something. And he met me at the door and he takes me outside and he says, don't share with these people. Because he knew I was going to, because they're Jehovah's Witness and they don't, you'll offend them. So I respected that. And, but uh, my customers came to know that I did that. And uh, the previous owner, a <clears throat> friend of mine that was a pastor before, he, he felt, I don't know what the word would be, but he wished that he had done more of that. But because of the financial need to make the company work and not lose any business, to pay for it because he had to buy it as well he was scared of that and when i thought about it what was more important what is more important to us to plant a seed for the kingdom of christ just a seed even if we're just a seed planter or to have a profitable business transaction i often often found that when I stepped out for God, 
that he blessed. He blessed over and over amazingly and also got the customers that were offended to kind of be forgotten for a while. You know, it just went on for quite a few, quite a few years. <laughs> Case of Steps to Christ, that's about 100 Steps to Christ a, a month that I was able to just give. Some of the wealthiest people in Calgary got great controversies. And if they expressed an interest at all, I bought them a special edition, you know, the hardcover and embossed and so on, so that it would look good on their library shelf, so it would at least stay there on their shelf. And one day, someone will pull that off the shelf. I believe that. Spirit of Prophecy tells us that. I, I fully believe that. In every fellow being, we are to see the purchase of the blood of Christ. The Savior's interest is identified with the interest of the interests of the souls he has ransomed by an infinite sacrifice. My brethren and sisters, do we realize the importance of this subject? Why are we so listless? Why are we so satisfied to remain so poorly fitted to work for the uplifting of humanity? Why is not every entrusted capability used for the Master? Why are so many contented with the feeble, lifeless condition of our churches? The heavenly universe is looking with amazement upon our Christless work. Neglect is seen in all our borders. Slipshod work is tolerated and passed by. How long shall this continue? Shall we not arise and with determined, harmonious effort take up our responsibilities, laboring in Christ's lines with sanctified capabilities? Put away the controversial spirit which you have been educating yourselves in for years. Educate yourselves to pray to God in sincerity and truth. Sing with the spirit and understanding also. Much is expected of us. What are our young men doing? Jesus is waiting to bind their hearts up with his great heart of love, to bind their interests with his own. He says to them, Young men, flee youthful lusts. Will you obey his voice? You are surely not doing this now. The truth is an inherent power, and if brought into the sanctuary of the soul, will draw men and women to Christ. It will win its way to human hearts. To those who look to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, re reveals the beauty of truth. He shows himself to be the sin-pardoning Savior. Young men, you may have the truth on your side. When your heart and all your faculties are brought under the influence of truth, when you bring the truth with all its living, sanctifying principles into your heart, you will have confidence to present it to others. Christ has then made unto you wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We are laborers together with God, and Christ is by your side. Ye are yoked up with him. He is leading and guiding. Such a worker is as a sharp sickle in the harvest field. He does not use his God-given powers in debating. That is Satan's line. Pointing to the cross of Calvary, he cries, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He urges sinners to behold eternal realities. He holds this telescope before his eyes, that by faith he may discern these realities. Eternal realities, you know, these are things to, to, to really think about. Like, I don't know, for me, eternal realities are so real, like really real. You know, when you see one or two people sort of die and come back to life, or things like this, and you see a soul and then feel the power of the enemy become really angry because you just helped rescue a soul from his clutches from the very death and it was an experience I had a long time ago don't have time to relate it all but I resuscitated a man who was basically dead at a party and people wanted to let him die um, not let him die they didn't think that 
they just said, let him sleep, he'll be fine. But I could see he wasn't breathing. I resuscitated him uh, in the summer morning, 4 a.m., sun coming up, and uh, been partying all night, running from God. I'd just gotten out of Christian college, CUC, Seventh-day Adventist school. And it was the best year of my life in school. But I, when I got out, I ran. I don't really fully understand why i was coming back to be a pastor in a couple months forget that so anyway i re resuscitate this man begged god for his life he started breathing and this pride prideful thought very distinctly still remember it look what i'm doing look what i'm doing then he stopped breathing <laughs> I choked up and stopped breathing. I lift my head sideways and I look up and I can see the sun on the horizon. And I uh, said, you know, God, I know it's you. I know it's you. Please let him live. And he did. Apparently, there's a more to that story about figuring that out, that he did live. But I'm telling this same story would have been at least 20, maybe 30 years later at a friend's house, telling them about this experience that I had, trying to share God with them and how real he was to me. And this guy jumps up off the couch. <laughs> and he says, that was me. <laughs> you don't remember? That was me. And it was a friend of a friend. So I, di I didn't spend a lot of time with him, but I knew who he was and I knew his name and I, Completely did not re remember his, him being there. But once he said that, you know, of course, it came back to me. But all those years, I wasn't sure if he lived or died after leaving there because I had to leave. I was exhausted. The enemy, like I convinced them to carry him into the house. And when they did, they they wouldn't call an ambulance. They didn't want to break up the party. And... uh he helped me get him into the house finally, and everyone's in the house and doing their thing. And, and I'm with him on the couch. And I, the, it was like a, could definitely feel it. And it was like I could see it. The darkness in the room with these people just having no care in the world for what was happening, totally unaware and not caring either. And uh, me with him on the couch, and he's having a hard time. You know, I really wanted to call an ambulance. But I was so exhausted, I had to leave. I just had to get out of there. And so I told him, I have to leave. Told him about God. He got, when I said he had to leave, I had to leave. He got really tense and grabbed me and didn't want me to go. And so I comforted him some more on the couch and we'll just help him relax. And I told him about God. I told him about heaven Think about these things. I've got to go, but God God is with you here. If you think about him, talk to him about it, what's going on. I left him, and when I told him that, he, he, he got this calm, like a peace, and he just totally relaxed, and I knew he was going to be okay, and he thought he was, and went back the next day. He wasn't there. No way could he have walked, And I thought. Went to check where he lived, found out where he lived, landlord said he moved out the day before and i thought everybody's in on this thing they're covering up they murdered the guy because what had happened it was he was in a fight he had been um, irritating people all night so finally a couple guys just took a task and beat him up uh, he was passed out on the ground kicked his head bashed his head down it's horrible violence to this guy but he survived. I thought he was dead. I thought he was. I wasn't sure. I, just, I continued to pray th for him through the years, interestingly enough, off and on. He had come to mind. And I'd pray for him. But that was really something, meeting him again uh, at a friend's house and telling the story. I'd met him before that, but I'd never told the story. So for some reason, we never talked about it, the two of us. I don't know how I got off on that rabbit trail, but I hope it's okay. <laughs> Shall this miserable work cease?
Those who have been, not been sinking the shaft deeper and still deeper into the mine of truth will see no beauty in the precious things presented at this conference. When the will is once set in stubborn opposition to the light given, it is difficult to yield, even under the convincing evidence which has been in this conference. Excuse me. To controvert, to question, to criticize, to ridicule, is the ed education many have received and the fruit they bear. They refuse to admit evidence. The natural heart is in warfare against light, truth, and knowledge. Jesus Christ has been in every sleeping room where you have been entertained. How many prayers went up, in, up to heaven in these rooms? And here she's speaking of seeing while they're visiting in each other's hotel room sort of thing. And it wasn't good what they were, the way they were behaving and speaking. Satan is fruitful in bringing up devices to evade the truth. But I call upon you to believe the words that I speak today. Truth of heavenly origin is confronting Satan's falsehoods. And this truth will prevail. We do well to remember that Christ is the light of the world and that fresh beams of light are constantly reflected from the source of all light. He who studies the truth, who prayerfully opens the eyes of his understanding to see and his heart to receive the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness, will be in harmony with the messenger and the message God sends. All the opposition all the prejudice, all the suggestions of the enemy will never make the truth less precious or less true. Only when men yield to the subtlety of the enemy does the truth become darkness to them. But even though the truth is opposed and spoken against by those who should be blessed, strengthened, and made joyful by it, its value and brightness is not lessened, for the Lord's messengers will hold up the telescope to the spiritual eye, that the truth may be seen from all points and its value appreciated. I like this uh, uh, word she uses, telescope, held up to the spiritual eye. Just previously, a page ago or so, she mentions about this telescope and discerning eternal realities. And that's kind of what this telescope helps the spiritual eye to see so that we can know its value and appreciate it. A fair investigation will not fail to reveal wonderful things in God's word. Every jot of resistance places the opposer in a darker shade. He does not want to see. He will not search God's word. But opposition and resistance only serve to bring out truth in new, distinct lines. The more truth is spoken against, the brighter it will shine. Thus, the precious ore is polished. Every word of slander is spoken against it. Every misrepresentation of its value awakens attention and is the means of leading to closer investigation as to what is saving truth. The truth becomes more highly estimated. New beauty and greater value are revealed from every point of view. Every word of slander spoken of against it, every misrepresentation of its value, awakens attention and is the means of leading to closer investigation as to what is saving truth. Saving truth is an interesting phrase. There's a, everyone seems to have their, their own idea. Well, not everyone, but there seems to be camps of what is saving truth i had a conversation recently with someone about desmond ford and i i commented nice guy but unfortunately very wrong and he, and he, his comment back was a lot of people who think they were right will not be in heaven and that being right doesn't save us i kind of understand where he was going with that is that you know, 
the thief didn't have time to do everything right, but someone who's lived 40 years does. And that truth does matter. I said, truth matters. But he was kind of more along the lines of thinking that as long as a guy thinks right with God, he's sincere and honest in his heart. And I agree with that. But there's a time coming where truth will be truth and error will be error. And if we believe error, we'll go into darkness. I, I just know that truth is sanctifying and has that sanctifying influence within the message itself of sharing it. Now, when I say message, remember the cashier at Walmart having a bad day. So I interact, try to be patient and gracious and, and kind in that interaction. It turns the whole thing around. Thinking of their soul, thinking of the next time I see them, maybe I'll be able to share a track or something. So I do that. I like to do that. And people like it mostly. But uh, yeah, to look at each person as as a soul for the kingdom, every one of them, no matter how bad they are or how good they are, the 1% in Calgary, they needed it. I like the chapter in Ministry of Healing, Ministry to the Rich, I think it's called. And she says how that this class of people also need people to minister to them because people don't they don't go to church typically they won't darken the church's door but if we can go to their home and i had access like that one guy he made his money on a an improved drill bit for the north sea he was a driller in the north sea he was scottish i think and uh he made made a lot of money and now he's living in a big house, mansion, Olympic-sized pool room. The pool house itself was the size of my house. And uh, he had everything, you know, that, that he could want financially, but not but. But, well, I was able to converse with his son, who was a teenager, and I told him about this book, The Great Controversy, and that uh, told him about it. He said, yeah, I'd read that. Well, here you go. And I gave him the embossed copy that I thought of. I don't know if he ever read it, but I'm sure that it's on their bookshelf still because it's a nice looking book. And, uh, you know, God will use that book somehow. I believe it. We need to be able to minister somehow to, to everyone. I kind of lost my place here. Um, I'll just, if I repeat a little bit, forgive me. The truth becomes more highly estimated. New beauty and greater truth is revealed from every point of view. Brethren, God is most precious light for his people. I call it not new light, but oh, it is strangely new to many. Jesus said to his disciples, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. This was really an old commandment which had been given in, in the Old Testament scriptures. But it had been lost. It had not been, <clears throat> excuse me, it had not been practiced. The command that they should love one another as Christ had loved them was indeed new to the disciples. But the revealing of this love would give to the world an unmistakable evidence that they were God's children. I call upon the young men who are entering the work as ministers to take heed how they hear. Be careful how you oppose precious truths of which you now have so little knowledge. Search the scriptures for yourselves. You have altogether too limited knowledge of yourself. Know for yourselves what is truth. Do not take any man's words, any man's prejudices, any man's arguments, any man's theories. This has been done by ministers to the injury of their experience. And it has left them novices when they should be wise in the scriptures and in the power of God. Take your Bibles, humble yourselves, weep and fast and pray before the Lord, as did Nathaniel, seeking to know the truth. Jesus' divine eyes saw Nathaniel praying and answered his prayer. I saw an angel of God inquiring of these men who have educated themselves as debaters. 
How many prayers have you offered? Oh, your levity, your speeches are all written in the book. If only you knew how Christ has regarded your religious attitude at this meeting. You must gain an experience for yourselves. I beg of you not to think that long sermons are an unmistakable evidence of your ministerial ability. Oh, there is something more to the ministry than sermonizing. Many, many discourses, like the offering of Cain, are profitless because Christless. Those who give them, those who give them tire the people and fail to give them proper spiritual food. Piety must be practiced in the home. Interested personal efforts must be made for those around you. Seek the Lord in private prayer. Ask Christ to do for you what you need to have done. He has been tempted in all points like as we are, and he knows how to strengthen or succor those who are tempted. He calls upon you to leave the atmosphere of unbelief in which you have been dwelling and place yourself in an atmosphere of faith and confidence. Do your best. Do not seek wisdom from finite men who may be bewildered by the temptations of Satan, who may plant the seeds of doubt rather than the seeds of faith. Go to Jesus, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, doesn't hold back. Has not his invitation reached your ears and touched your heart? He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. To yoke up with Christ, I I know a little bit about the actual, like when you're yoking up the oxen, and uh, when they yoked them up, two could pull, I don't know, you know, three times as much as one, two together. And to yoke up with Christ is like that. We can pull, we can achieve in Christ by yoking up with him that which we could never do alone. Let no human hand place a yoke upon your neck. Take the yoke Christ gives. Learn of him, for he is meek and lowly, and you will find rest. It is Christ's meekness and lowliness that you need. Go to the Lord with the faith, simplicity, and confidence of a little child. Tell him the whole trouble, withholding nothing. Ask him to teach you how to use your entrusted talents in the best way. Thus you may increase your talents if you go out to the out to labor in any portion of the Lord's great moral vine- vineyard. Take heed. Keep watch over yourself, over your thoughts and words. Pray for an understanding heart, for a knowledge of how to humble yourself before the Lord. Ask, I'm going to read that again. If you go out out to labor in any portion of the Lord's great moral vineyard, take heed. Keep watch over yourself, over your thoughts and words. Pray for an understanding heart for a knowledge of how to humble yourself before the Lord. I've shared before that shared before that I've struggled with addictions in the past, you know, 20 years plus ago for a little while, a seven year period or longer. And what was it that just unmistakable evidence what you need to be done? He knows how to strengthen those who are tempted lost it right now the idea is is that uh, god the three steps the first three three steps are summed up simply and that is i can't god can i'll let him that's righteousness by faith you know it really is i can't god can i'll let him to cooperate with god 
Those who would be laborers together with God must receive wisdom from the great teacher who is our example in all things in order to present the truth in its simplicity. Learn of Christ. All pride, all selfishness, all self-importance must be cut away from all teachers. All the, in this word I don't know, all the sang Freud, S-A-N-G dash Freud, F-R-O-I-D, Sang Freud. All the Sang Freud, which is so common, would, would someone look that up for for us and share that? Sang Freud, S-A-N-G, dash. Well, Sang Freud means uh, cold blood in French. I presume it just means people having a coldness toward, toward others instead of having compassion. What does it mean again? It's a, it's a French. It means uh, cold blood. Yeah, cold blood in French. Cold. Okay, sang Freud. Cold. All the sang Freud. All the cold bloodedness. Mm-hmm. Is that how it would go? Sort of. Okay, they don't care. Cold blooded about. They don't. They're not caring. All the sang Freud, which is so common, the theatrical gestures all lightness and trifling, all jesting and joking, must be seen by the one who wears Christ's yoke to be not convenient, an offense to God and a denial of Christ. It unfits the mind for solid thought and solid labor. It makes men inefficient, superficial, and spiritually diseased. You know, I, we, I'm sure all of us have seen in the church this... Uh, thing that's happening happening culturally in a lot of the ch- seventh day adventist churches is a theatrical bent uh another program to a human man-made program to reach or copy other programs from other churches a lot of uh, one pastor he never started a sermon without a joke and i and it was an innocent enough chuckle for the congregation kind of to warm them up i suppose was his thinking you know i shared with him uh ministry well he well knew them the quotes but it was a uh, in speech and song ministry and voice speech and song something like that it's a small pamphlet but i shared with him and another friend of mine also shared with him both of us these quotes about joking in the pulpit and how it wasn't a good thing and he just did not accept it at all not at all but it was i i at times if i knew if i knew he was giving the sermon that sabbath i went elsewhere or when i didn't know and it happened to be him i just could not endure it i and it wasn't a sense of me being better than or anything i was i just couldn't <laughs> I couldn't sit there and listen to it in another church, perhaps, but I expect more from the Seventh-day Adventist message. He who believes the truth for this time will practice personal piety. The language of his heart will be, who is sufficient for these things? Let every minister be sedate. I'm not sure what she means by that. Let every minister be sedate. As he studies the life of Christ, he will see the necessity of walking circumspectly. Yet he may be, and will be, if connected with the Son of Righteousness, cheerful and happy, showing forth the praises of him who has called him out of darkness into his marvelous light. This conversation, life, will be pure, entirely free of all... Oh, sorry. The conversation will be pure, entirely free of all slang phrases. If Christ is abiding in your heart, you will show meekness and gentleness and purity of thought. You will follow elevated, noble principles because you have learned the lessons taught in the school of Christ. If you have not felt the need of learning every day in this school, it is time you did feel this need. Learn of Christ. And then go to the strength of him who has said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. A divided heart God will not accept. Put your whole soul into your work, and never leave your work half done. 
because you wish to go to another place. Here she's addressing the idea of mission work. And each, there was this thing going on where young ministers would come up with a bright idea of going to this mission field or that, but without consulting with the brethren of experience. And this is where that quote really, it comes down to the meaning of that quote, submitting to the brethren of experience. She wasn't talking about submitting in matters of doctrine and belief because Ellen White encouraged individual thought and individual study, personal study. But she was speaking about the missionary work that was going on, and it was a growing church, and everybody wanted to go this way and that. But she was saying, we have elder brethren of experience who have done this mission work before and submit your idea of going off to this mission field to the brethren of experience and if they see no light in it leave it alone that was what she meant light in the mission field it wasn't about doctrine if they see no light in this teaching that's not that's the way it has been applied and wrongfully so I wish I would have known that a lot sooner because it was one of the quotes that was was really pressed upon me to uh, to submit my thoughts on the 2520 and associated ideas, but I just couldn't, and I didn't see the sense in it. So it didn't make sense, and the reason is because it doesn't make sense. And to understand what it actually meant was... It was specifically about mission work, not about doctrine and belief. To submit to another man, our conscience, between us and God, that's not right. Don't do it. A minister is one who ministers. If you confine your work to sermonizing, the flock of God will suffer, for they need personal effort. Let your discourses be short. Long sermons were out both you and the people. If ministers would make their sermons only half as long, they would do more good and would have strength left for personal work. Visit families, pray with them, converse with them, search the scriptures with them, and you will do them good. Give them evidence that you seek their prosperity and want them to be healthy Christians. If you are staying in a family, do not allow yourself to be waited on. Show that you wish to be helpful. If possible, use the axe or the hoe. Bring in water and wood. Show that you regard work as a blessing. Physical exercise will be a blessing to you and will increase your influence for good. Remember that to minister means far more than merely preaching. Nothing is so discouraging to the advancement of present truth as the haphazard work done by some of the ministers for the churches. Faithful laborers are needed. The church Churches are ready to die because they are not strengthened in Christ's likeness. The Lord is not pleased with the loose way in which the churches are left because men are not faithful stewards of God's grace. They do not receive his grace and therefore cannot impart it. The churches are weak and sickly because of the unfaithfulness of those who are supposed to labor among them, whose duty it is to have an oversight over them watching for souls as they must give an account. Be thorough and determined in your efforts to serve God. Keep the eye fixed on Christ. Do not fix your attention on some favorite minister, copy, copying his example and imitating his gestures. In short, becoming his shadow. Let no man put his mold upon you. Let the hand of God mold and fashion you after the divine similitude. Cease from man whose breath is in his nostrils. Hang your helpless soul on Jesus Christ. He is unchangeable, the same yesterday, today, and forever. My heart was made glad as I heard the testimonies born after the discourse on Sabbath. These testimonies made no reference to the speaker, but to the light and truth. And this is the way it should ever be. Praise no man, flatter no man, and permit no man to praise or flatter you. 
Satan will do enough of this work. Lose sight of the instrument and think of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Give glory to God. Make melody to God in your hearts. Talk of the truth. Talk of the Christian's hope, the Christian's heaven. If we neglect to walk in the light given, it becomes darkness to us. And the darkness is proportionate to the light and privileges which we have not improved. Christ says, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. If we walk in the knowledge of the truth, our light will shine to those around us in spirit, in words, in actions. We will be fruitful branches of the living vine. If we know God's requirements and claim to love him, yet cherish sin, God will not hear us when we ask for his blessing, for he does not minister to sin. There are those who, whose conscience is hardened by habitual sin. They bear no rich clusters of precious fruit because they are not branches of the true vine. Their prayers rise no higher than their heads because they are in their prayer. Their prayers rise no higher than their heads because they are in their prayers presenting only a form of words, whether offered in the church, in the family, or in secret. They receive no strength because they ask amiss. But when those who are striving with all their power to overcome confess their sins, God is faithful and just to forgive their sins and to cleanse them from all unrighteousness for Christ's sake. When brought into the sanctuary of the soul, the truth of God works by faith and purifies the soul, elevating, refining, ennobling it. There was a time when Israel could not prevail against their enemies. This was because of Achan's sin, God declared. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed thing from among you. God is the same today. If defiling sins are cherished by those who claim to believe the truth, the, the displeasure of God rests upon the church, and he will not remove it until the members do all in their power to show their hatred for sin and their determination to cast it out of the church. God is displeased with those who call evil good and good evil. If jealousy, evil surmising, and evil speaking are allowed to have a place in the church, that, that church is under the frown of God. It will be spiritually unhealthy until it is cleansed from these sins. For till then, God cannot reveal his power to strengthen and elevate his people and give them glory. That's a tricky one for me. I'll share later why, but the tricky part is, let's see here, um, not li basically not living up to the truth that we know. And, and uh, God, God can't bless us, really. But he can. It's a funny thing that, I've seen in my life, because I've walked apart from God, thinking I was, but somehow he's always there in the shadows. As long as there is breath, there is hope. As long as we haven't rejected light, but we're just struggling with our fallen human natures, I think God understands that and bears with it a bit, a bit more than a bit. <laughs> Let none sh shut themselves away from God by their perversity of spirit, and then keep complaining that they have no light. Arise, dear souls, arise by faith, and do what you ought to do. Christ says, follow me, and you will not walk in darkness. Let your human wisdom, and ask God, let go your human wisdom, and ask God for that wisdom which is pure, elevating, and ennobling, and it shall be given you. Come out up out of the cellar of doubt, of unbelief, of jealousy, and evil surmising, into the upper chamber of faith, hope, courage, and thankfulness. Make melody to God in the heart. The garden of the Lord is strewn with precious flowers. Gather the roses and the lilies and the pinks from God's spiritual garden. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let not the world receive the impression that there is no peace, nor joy, nor happiness in serving the Lord. 
It is Satan's work to misrepresent the Father and his Son, to misrepresent truth and gloss over error, making it appear as truth. But connected with God, we may distinguish between the genuine and the spurious. Light will dispel darkness. Why should we not avail ourselves of God's gracious promises, returning the glory to him in heartfelt thanksgiving? Christ died for us that we might enter into possession of eternal riches. With hearts filled with gratitude to God, let us use the opportunities he has placed within our reach that we may be fitted and prepared for the mansions Jesus has gone to prepare for those who love him. If we fail through indolence, unbelief, worldliness, or covetousness, we shall suffer irreparable loss, for we shall lose an eternity of bliss. I tell you in the fear of God that day by day we are forming characters that will decide our destiny for weal or for woe. Heaven is a holy place, and there entereth into it nothing that defileth. We cannot be truly happy here in heaven unless God's will is our will, unless we are sanctified to God, body, soul, and spirit. The more we think of heaven, the more happiness we shall have. We cannot be happy here in this world, I guess is what she's saying, unless God's will is our will, sanctified to God, body, soul, and spirit. Something pretty neat happened today. Really interesting, actually. It's a little bit of a long story, so I'll save it for tomorrow. But I'd like what I would like to encourage is for tomorrow I, I have another sermon that I'd like to share, but for for tomorrow think of I would like each person to think of their life with God and how God has worked in your life. It's a big it's a big question, but it doesn't have to be all of it. Just something particularly particular that you undoubtedly knew it was God doing, directing, providing, taking away, directing our lives. I got something that's just blows me away. So I hope. I hope you guys can think of something like that to share with all of us tomorrow a little bit. Sermon and then our experience with God. Okay, yeah, we'll close. Let's pray. Father, we so much thank you for the Sabbath that's coming upon us here in the north and all in a round world. How the Sabbath comes to each one of us and we're grateful for it. Help us to see the depth of blessings, deeper and deeper blessings that are in the Sabbath. And for the things that I read this evening, if we could remember one thing from it that you can use to help us have that experience that each one of us need, to trust you in the times when we are crushed or elevated, to keep our eye on you, so that when lifted up, we do not fall from it because of our human hearts are so prone to pride, or when debased, abused, or losses in life, that we do not become despondent and discouraged that you perhaps have left us or that we have done things that have made us so vile that you forsake us. So grateful, Lord, for the experience and knowledge, the truth that I have learned personally, that as long as there is breath, don't give up hope on anyone, and especially on ourselves, Lord. We see the high standard of Christian perfection that you want to see, need to see, in your people in order to bring about the final message of mercy which it has to go out to this world through sanctified vessels. Lord, we look at ourselves, and when we do, it's easy to see how it's impossible for me, for each one of us, when we look at our lives, really, honestly. 
in comparison to the high standard of Jesus, the perfect example of Jesus. But he got that just as we can. He had to connect with divinity, and we need to connect with divinity. And the only way that's going to happen is to have the experience of Isaiah for our pride to be laid in the dust. As painful as that can be, we know it's necessary. We trust our lives in your hand, that process in your providence, and we look forward to tomorrow in your promises. Thank you, Father. And Jesus' name, we, we thank you and close this looking to you still. Amen.